Hey everyone, it's Connor here from Durham Hearing Specialists. I hope you're doing well and welcome back to a very interesting case. We've been asked to talk again about canal cholesteatoma, specifically the, the detail and the mechanics of how it progresses. So I thought I'd use this case to talk about it. This is a 28 year old female, no comorbidities, no ENT history, no history of ear trauma, um, but this ear has been weeping on and off for, for a couple of months. Um, so let's just start by sort of reviewing what we know already, which is, and I think most people understand this, that, that canal cholesteatoma is essentially starts as a sort of defect in the bony portion of the meatus. So it's like a little depression or crater or trench or sulcus, which inadvertently acts as a kind of graveyard for the squamous epithelium to get lost into. So the epithelium, you know, gets pushed out from the umbo, across the drum, then down the canal, until it reaches the sort of outer third where it then sloughs off and becomes earwax. But in this particular case, it, it, it migrates into this defect and then gets lost and then sloughs off. And then you have this kind of growing mass of wet, dead skin. <coughs> now, let's talk a bit about pressure, which is not, I think, the main driving factor here, but I think it's relevant. And this is a good example here. When you have pressure, on bone, you have something called bone resorption. Now this is, this is actually quite normal, you know, and you can get it in other parts of your body. You know, if you take up running or you start lifting weights or whatever, there will be an element of, of restructure where you have your osteoclasts breaking down bone in an organized fashion, that's intentional, and then osteoblasts building the matrix back up. Now, so if you think about canal cholesteatoma, which is again, putting a sort of mild but constant pressure on the meatus, or if you think about keratosis obturans, okay, you know, if you look here, this, this, this cavity is actually quite smooth, isn't it? It's quite smooth and it's actually, you know, coated with nice pink healthy tissue. And that's because that at least most of the cavity at this stage has, has widened due to bone resorption. There is a little bit of bone erosion, which is different, on the left side of the cavity, and you'll see me pull out a bit of bone in a moment, or what we call sequestra. But what's happened here is that this, this cholesteatoma, and remember when, when this mass of dead skin gets wet, it will temporarily and acutely get larger, which can cause pain in a similar fashion to keratosis obturans. But because there's been this mild, constant downward pressure on the tissues, the osteoclasts have been activated, they've been breaking down that bone, that calcium phosphate matrix, releasing it back into the blood. And that's why you're not seeing any, at this stage, ulceration or a lot of erosion per se. Um, you'll see me pull out a little bit of sequestra here. It looks kind of like a jigsaw piece. So that's one factor. You know, you'll have, a, you'll have this widening of the, the, the defect, which is again, going to help the cholesteatoma get bigger essentially. And remember that it's always being fed, there it is. It's always being fed by that conveyor belt, that natural uh, epithelial migration. But that's not the only story. Let's talk a little bit about um, bacteria and inflammation. So we, we've discussed this before briefly in terms of, you know, the nuts and bolts of otitis externa. But when you have soggy dead skin in the ear and elsewhere in the body, you, that is a perfect breeding ground and habitat and food source for microorganisms, so bacteria and fungi. And if you ever read up on cholesteatoma, whether it's middle ear or canal, you'll often see reference to saprophytic bacteria or saprotrophic bacteria. Sapros just means dead or decaying. I think it means corpse actually in Latin or Greek. And troph means to feed. So saprotrophic bacteria or saprophytic bacteria means bacteria that like to eat dead stuff. So you can imagine if there's a wet mass of dead skin just kind of sitting there, which can't be cleaned, then um, there's gonna, that's going to be a perfect breeding ground for these microorganisms. And what the bacteria do is they, A, release toxins, which is going to trigger an, uh, uh, an inflammatory response, but B, they will release proteolytic enzymes. What does that mean? Proteo meaning protein, which are the building blocks of your cells. The word lytic or lysis mean, actually means to split, split, split apart or break apart. So think about a hydrolysis reaction in chemistry. And then enzyme is just like a complicated molecule that allows these chemical reactions to occur. So these bacteria are basically releasing 
uh, like tissue damaging cell breaking enzymes okay and we can understand how that works because it's it's you know when that's released it's going to damage the, the tissue and epithelium around the cholesteatoma further adding to it and of course enabling the erosion of bone so the ulceration of skin and then the breakdown of of, of that matrix which is why i was able to pull out that sequestra earlier um, now in addition to that the inflammatory response well, we'll, that's triggered by the, the trauma and the toxins, the, the inflammatory response will never win, you know, because what, there's no way for the cholesterol to be resolved naturally by, the, by all your white blood cells. So when you have this inflammation around the cholesterol, you'll get white blood cells recruited to the area. So you'll have, you know, there'll be neutrophils cycling, you know, circulating around your bloodstream. When they eke out of the capillaries, we call them macrophages. And these macrophages, my, macro means big, phage means eat. So these are the types of, you know, white blood cells that you'll see on videos and stuff like crawling around and engulfing the bacteria. So these macrophages will crawl towards the area of infection or trauma. And uh, macrophages can also release proteolytic enzymes. So the tissues, you know, of, of the canal are getting hit from all angles. And it's impossible for the macrophages to, you know, invade the cholesterol and clear everything up. It's not going to happen. So this inflammatory response is, you know, not, not doing what the body wants it to do, which is to promote healing and kill infection. One more thing that I think I should mention is the release of growth factor. And, and that is normal when you have an inflammatory response, but you have chemicals that are released there's probably loads of cytokines flying around that I don't really understand, but th something that jumps to mind is epidermal growth factor, or, or EGF. And what, when you have this release of growth factor, what happens, which is a, you know, a chemical messenger cytokine, growth factor will cause the, um, the sort of basal layer of the epidermis, which is like the skin cell factory, to start replicating very, very quickly. So you have a, a rapid cell turnover, an uptick. So what's going to happen? You have the perfect storm. You have more skin cells being produced very, very rapidly. Those skin cells are being very readily damaged um, by all of these proteolytic enzymes. You have that increasing the size of the cholesterol, providing more food source for the bacteria, there's more downward pressure on the tissues, leading to more bone resorption. And then of course, to top it all off, you have the natural conveyor belt mechanism of the meatus anyway. And, and the result is this massive dead skin, which isn't like a malignant tumor, but does act like it in the sense that it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, damaging the tissues, widening everything. And in you know, the case that you just saw, I suppose it looks a little neat because the patient just finished a 10-day course of otomize. So that, I suppose, calms down the inflammation a little bit, but it will come back. And I suppose at this stage, it's not near anything important per se, but if it goes anterior, it could interfere with the temporal mandibular joint. And obviously if it goes posterior, it'll connect into the mastoid system and so on and so forth. So this patient will definitely need an operation. And what the ENT surgeon will do is go in and, and drill it all smooth so that's what we call a canal plasty or meatoplasty. So they will technically be making the canal bigger, but what they're aiming to do is by drilling it smooth, they're getting rid of that little defect. So they're getting rid of that little graveyard where the, so the, the epithelium can kind of migrate across a nice smooth canal rather than this sort of undulation. So anyway, hopefully this quick fire video was helpful to you and answered some of your questions if you have any questions leave them down in the comment section below and i'll try my very best to get back to you and of course i will see you guys on the next video